Welcome to the 12th and final session of Revelation Reimagined. We are so glad you've been on this journey with us, this journey of discovery. And the thing we want to say right now is there is so much more yet to discover about what God wants us to know. Revelation Reimagined has just been really a, a chance to look at some of the big themes and the big pictures of the book and the way that it reveals Jesus, the way that it gives us an insight into the, the end of time and the times of the end. And as we go through this final session, we get this light, bright, glorious picture of what God has prepared for us. So we thank you for being with us once more on this final online discussion and exploration of the book of Revelation. With me, as last time, I have Roman Halupka on my left, Peter Hughes further along, and Michael Mahanu at the other end, and my name's Darren Croft. We are four Adventist pastors who love to study the book of Revelation and to share it with others and to discover what it says to us today. In our last chapter, we dug into Revelation 20. We just have a, a graphic to remind us of what we looked at there, where Revelation 20 picks it up just after the second coming of Christ, where Satan is bound for a thousand years and the, the living at that point, that are the believers in Christ, those that have been resurrected, then spend that thousand years with Christ. And of course, then at the end of it, Revelation 20 pictured that time where the, the, the books, um, I guess, revealed the, the truth of, of what had happened and the devil and the wicked are destroyed forever. Sin is no more. And we enter then into this perfect new world that, that Jesus wants us to experience. And so as we come into chapter 21, we're going to get a, a glimpse of this. And I guess the ultimate picture of that, that thousand years is, you know, not, as we said last time, that God has a torture chamber. He does not. He's a God of love. But in the end, God will bring justice because love demands justice. And so as we now see this picture, this is what God has in store for all that choose him today and tomorrow and whenever. So let's have a look at Revelation chapter 21, and we'll start by reading the first four verses. It says there, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of, of things has passed away. Now, if you haven't read the rest of these chapters yet, just pause for a moment before we start our discussion, have a read of chapter 21 and 22, then hit play again and rejoin us. This is a beautiful picture. In fact, the whole chapter is beautiful. What stands out for you? It's the dream of every single human being to have that perfect life um, with no death. Yeah. I mean, we all have been affected, you know, in a way or another by death or mourning or crying or pain. Um, yeah, it's just the, the blissful life. Yeah. Um, something to, to long for, to look for, something to work towards. Um, it's just so beautiful. Mm -hmm. And no sea. Mm. Well, it, we should explain, you know, John is on the island of Patmos. The sea just, mm. you know, that's the problem for him because it divides him from his beloved church in Ephesus. So, so, sea is separation, isn't separation. it? Separation. And, yeah. and I think maybe we've all experienced in that in, in some ways where, you know, we, we lived over the sea in New Zealand for a while and you felt that separation yeah. because you couldn't yeah. jump in a car and drive and see your family. Exactly. So that's something beautiful. Again, for John, that, that's, 
see is often used symbolically in scripture, and we've talked about it in this series, haven't yeah. we? Yeah. See also prophetically means people, nations, multitudes. And this is saying no more peoples, multitudes, nations and tribes. We're all one. We're all one. Mm. We're all in harmony. Yeah. Yes. It's interesting, isn't it? You see those those multiple levels of meaning in it and they all lead us to yeah. the same place. Yeah. It's, it's, yes. yeah. yeah. We, we've seen the temple last time um, at the plagues and the temple was filled up with uh, smoke and uh, we said, well, that's when the intercession came to an end and that's when the plague started. Mm. But now we see in, uh, in chapter 21 that actually there's no need for a temple, you know. Well, well it just says there is no temple. There is it? no temple because there is no need for a temple. The mm. temple was a temporary establishment to, to deal with the, uh, the, the problem of sin, mm. all right? And I know that in Christianity there is this um, understanding and theological explanation that the third temple has to be rebuilt in Jerusalem and like everyone is keeping their eyes on, on that temple. Is that necessary when actually the Bible tells us we do have a temple? We do have a temple in heaven where Jesus is the intercessor, is the high priest, and we have all the services that we need for him. And then his intercession comes to an end. There's no need for the temple because we are with So it's not Christ. that we have to stand and tremble in fear because we no longer have an intercessor. It's that's done. That's done. Finished. Can I raise the issue that Peter raised, and that is that we are living stones in a living temple here on earth. Yeah, and yeah. it is going to be a holy place constructed by God. So in effect, we are part of his temple. Yes. I, I once had someone say to me, you know, so if there's no temple in there now, does that mean God's brought in his celestial wrecking, you know, wrecking ball and knocked the temple out? I, I don't think we need to get caught up like that because it's, it's symbolism. It's symbolism communicating something greater, isn't it? Which is what you're getting at. Yes. Yes. Uh, but the most important is Jesus will be there. Yes. And for, for most of us, he will be seen and maybe touched for the first time because we only read about him. We believed in him. We missed him. But now he will be in front of us. And that's, that's something I can't imagine because that's such a great multitude and everyone could see him and be so close. Well, it will be possible. Anyhow, we have the eternity for this. That's right. There'll, no time limitations. Yeah. Uh, the, there's a personal uh, aspect in this last sentence that you've got up on the screen. It says, for the old, old order of things has passed away. Well, I'm one of the old order. <laughs> <laughs> and it means my age is gone. I'm, I'm no yeah. longer will be part of the old order. Or will be, you will have been transformed. Will be transformed. The, the other thing I like with that one, it, you know, it talks about he will wipe every tear from their eyes. You know, it's this very personal picture of God. You know, this is not the distant God. This is the God who yeah. you know, wipes the tears from our very yeah. eyes. And uh, amazing picture. Yeah. The, the other thing on the temple that, that I see there. Um, the dimensions of the New Jerusalem, yeah. it's a cube. Happens to be that the most holy place in the temple was also a cube in, in dimensions. Yeah. Hmm. So it, it adds to what you're saying, Peter, that we are going to be in the presence of God in the most holy place. Yeah. So it, it says a loud voice from the throne. Well, the one who sits on the throne in heaven for us is Christ. Yeah. And he's saying, look. My dwelling place is not here in heaven. My dwelling place is with my people. And he's talking about an earth made new. Yeah. He's saying that the earth is going to become the centre of his universe and our universe. Yeah. As you go on then into the remainder of Revelation 21, which we, we won't put up on the screen, you see this description well you see this this announcement that you know it is done i am the alpha and omega the beginning and the end is is you know the words we have from jesus i will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to anyone who thirsts but it then goes on and describes this new jerusalem in amazing detail and you get precious jewels and giant pearls and light and bright and 
you know, gold being so mm. common that the streets are made of it. What do you see um, that it's attempting to, to convey to us here about this yes. city? All the precious things of life are what will be accomplished when we are part of that city and that those people and are those people in life. Mm -hmm. What you consider precious now is going to be common, common <laughs> every day. Yeah. Not, it... hmm. We think of like, what would be the best thing that can happen to you in your life? Well, I would like to go on a cruise for 30 days around the world to visit the most beautiful places, you know, just let the imagination go. Mm. Just multiply that with a thousand times. <laughs> yeah. You'll get the image of Revelation. So we see uh, Apostle John struggling to find his words to explain something that he saw that is, is such an unimaginable beauty and said, this is what God has prepared for those people that have not worshipped the beast, have not received the mark of the beast, and have been faithful to him. Don't you want to be there? That, that's what I, I get when I read this. Yeah. Don't you want to get there? I know that there are people that have tried to, you know, put the, all the dimensions and to, uh, you know, just the, the artist rendition, uh, but it's still limited by human thinking. Yes. Uh, for me, what the text is telling me is like, you know, it's beyond our imagination. It's so beautiful. It's so amazing, so bright uh, that you want to be there. You have to be there. There's no dark corners. No. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that, you know, <laughs> it doesn't appeal to me, you know, those riches, gold, I'm yeah, so, so what if the road's you know, made of gold? But, but you yeah. know what? It just came to my mind that, you know, the only gold that I have is my wedding ring. Oh. And, you know, I don't treasure the wedding ring. I just think always about somebody who is behind it, because that's because of my wife that I love. So, so I think that all those precious things that I mentioned there, uh, for most of the people, it, it doesn't mean, it, well, what is it? What, how much we have? But, mm -hmm. but you know, uh, but we know who is behind it. It's mm -hmm. Jesus that we love so much. And he's, he's just using the impressions, the, the words, the, the expression that, that will maybe appeal to us, but, but he's behind it. That's the most important. And, and clearly there's a lot of symbolism here yeah. because, oh, yeah. you, because you have all the twelves and the multiples of twelve. So it's almost like it's, you know, caps shouting at us, kingdom of God, kingdom of God. You've got this wall that, yeah. that means it's safe to be in, but then you've got these twelve gates that are never closed. Yeah. So, you know, it's... So it's why, why the wall? Exactly. The wall? So it's communicating safety and security yeah. in God but also the accessibility and the openness of God. Yeah. And, and it's doing those things simultaneously in a way that works, yeah. but it doesn't make sense if it's you know, put yeah. together in, in that way. You, you talked earlier in this series about 12 numbers, mm. and we've all through the presentations we've highlighted the fact that there were 12 tribes of the nation of Israel. God's people were divided into 12, and each gate has a name of one of those tribes on it. Yeah. But then with the cross, the 12 tribes of Israel had rejected Christ, so there was a new group of people, the Gentiles, the, the rest of the world. The, the foundations of this holy city are 12 special stones, mm. precious stones. So, and each foundation has the name of the disciples on it. So it is covering the 12 tribes of Israel, the people mm. before the cross, and the foundations tell us that the people after the cross are the foundation on which the church is built. Anyone, so, anyone who wants to be there can choose to be there. If you've made a choice for Christ and to be part of this city and, and have the most precious things that you would really could imagine... Yeah as part of your life, then this city highlights that. Yeah. Uh, I, I love it that, that you, you, we just underlined the importance of the symbols. Mm. Because, because, you know, 
As God created this world and created Adam and Eve, he didn't put them in the city. Mm. He put them in agricultural, you know, environment. And, and it's completely different. So did God change the mind? I don't think so. He's, he's rebuilding the picture. But, but you know, the, uh, the symbols are just to help us to understand. I think so. That's the only way we, we have to, because I, I still remember one beautiful pastor I, I met, I, I knew so well many, many years ago. He passed away, of course. But, but you know, I remember he made the model of the Holy City. <laughs> And, and, you know, he put so much so attention and, and everything was so particular. And I suddenly came seeing it and I said something that got him nervous. And I was so embarrassed because of that. Be- because, you know, he put the tree of life on the bottom, uh, you know, on the bottom of this. Uh, in fact, there was, uh, we know the, the measures of it. Mm. That's not on the length, that's not on the width, but also the height. So I said, why didn't you put it here? And I showed the, in the middle of this box. And he said, well, in the air. <laughs> and there was, there was something, you know. But uh, I'm just mentioning it. It's over our imagination. It, it reminds me, um, in Ezekiel chapter 1, there is this description that Ezekiel gives of God. And it's, it's if, if you've ever read the chapter... Um, it's a bit mind blowing because you've got, you know, wheels within wheels and eyes in the, the rims of the wheels and all sorts of things. And, and by the time you get to the end of the, the chapter, we, we're almost getting to Ezekiel describing what he sees. And he says, like the appearance of a rainbow in a cloud on a rainy day, so was the appearance of the brightness all around. This, notice now what he does was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. So he doesn't say, this is exactly what it looked like. He's four steps removed. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And I think in in John's language here, we're seeing him trying to convey a reality that is greater than our minds can grasp. So let's go to chapter 21. Um, if you want to pick up any more in chapter 20, that's fine. But we, uh, sorry, chapter 22. Because in chapter 22, it's almost like we, we have this bookend of the, the, the whole Bible. You know, in, in Genesis, in the Garden of Eden, you have a tree of life. You mentioned the tree of life, Roman. Yeah. Here in the New Jerusalem, a tree of life. A little different, but a tree of life. What else do you see that we, we're we bookending the Bible here, bringing things to a close? As we've gone through, starting with chapter 2 and 3, God described the people of God, his people, in seven stages, seven churches. And with each... With each of those seven stages, there was a promise. Mm -hmm. And the promise was the reverse of what happened in the Garden of Eden. Like they, Adam and Eve were excluded from the tree of life. They lost eternal life. And then they discovered that they were naked and and so on. So there was a, a mounting number of promises as you went through those seven stages of the church. And all of them are reversed in Revelation and in the New Jerusalem. Mm. All of the things that were lost are restored to mankind. A final restoration. Yes, yes. God has given back everything that was lost. Yeah. Because Christ, in effect, was the second Adam. Mm. The first Adam was a man and he lost eternal life. So all men lost eternal life. Christ came as a man, and as a man he overcame sin and then gave the opportunity for people to be reinstated with what had been lost. So as as Adam lost his connection, his attachment to God, Jesus restores that connection. But but you have to be connected with Christ. Mm. So your salvation comes through Christ and that. 
Well, we, we know that the Bible was written on a span of 1,500 years. Um, and many things can happen within 1,500 years, all right? Mm. People change the understanding, the worldview. Uh, they can change the, the, uh, the concepts, uh, theories, and philosophies and things. What is amazing in the Bible is... Like during this span of 1500 years, these people that have been faithfully writing the Bible, they don't turn to the left or to the right. Mm -hmm. They remain faithful to the book of Genesis and then they develop the story, what happened from there. And it culminates with John writing the book of Revelation that wraps everything together. And it brings like so beautifully the, the resolution to the crisis that appeared uh, 6,000 6, years before when God created the world and sin came into the world and Adam and Eve sinned and the destruction that took place. And now it connects everything. It's like undoing the, all the damage that evil have have brought into God's universe and doing all that yeah. and bringing the eternal plan that God had initially. So we see the tree of life here. We see the tree of life here. We see the creation here. We see a new creation here. And, and the parallel continues. We see sin appears here. Sin disappears forever, never to appear again. And there's a, a huge list, maybe slowly, slowly we'll go through that list to, to, to see how the book of Revelation actually it, it, it brings everything home. Mm. And without that book, we'll remain with a, something without an end, a story without an end, without a it, it, It's also picking up on those parallels. Um, you also have, you know, at the beginning, God creates light. Now here in the city, he is the light. Yeah. Um, another one is, you know, in Eden, his desire was to be with his people and for them to be with him. That's repeated in the wilderness where Israel come out of Egypt and God creates a temple so that he might dwell with his people um, and, and be with them. And that's lost, of course, over time. But now the, this comes through in 21 and 22. God is now with his people and his people are with him. Yeah. And it's, it's, it really does. It uses the wedding imagery because... This has the joy and the celebration of a long-awaited wedding. Yeah. Uh, you know, magnificent picture from that point of view. Um, so as, as we consider this, I guess, these two chapters as the, the wrap-up of, of Revelation, why do you think it connects so much back to the Old Testament, both in chapter 21 and 22? There is a picture many times, especially in, in Isaiah, that is, comes to me, to my mind now. You know, this beautiful promise of the new earth. The, the last chapters. Although it's mentioned before, but the last chapters are yeah. really the crowning of everything, you know. That's, that's beautiful. That's fantastic. So we have the same. So we, have, we, we already are there, and, and that's the picture in the 66th chapter, you know, of, of, of God that we are coming to him. And then, so, so that's, that's the same. That's how he, as a prophet, could, could understand those days. We, we have much uh, fuller, more, more details we, yeah. we can put to this. Yeah. yeah. And, and what, what, what we discovered is that the book of Revelation doesn't basically bring anything new in a sense of theology. It just brings everything back home, all right? So the concept of new earth and new heaven is, is nothing new there. Yeah. And um, you mentioned the book of uh, Isaiah. Let me just read a few verse he verses here. Uh, because the book uh, Isaiah gives us glimpses, actually, what is going to be there. So I'm looking at Isaiah chapter 65, verses 17 to 25. So our viewers, uh, please feel free to go uh, to Isaiah 65, verses 17 to 25. It's a beautiful description of life on the new earth. It says, Beyond, uh, Behold, I create, I will create new heavens and the new earth. The former things will not be remembered, 
nor will they come to mind. And then it describes and it reaches um, um, the final verse, final uh, verse 25, the wolf and the lamb will feed together, exactly like in the book of, in, 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 in Eden, in the book of Genesis. Where, in, where, where God created animals not to eat each other, or humans to eat animals, all right? Uh, and the lion will eat straw like the ox, but dust uh, will be the serpent's food. Uh, they will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain. So we know that in Australia we have 10 of the most um, venomous uh, <laughs> snakes in the world. So uh, uh, probably they will not be there for sure. <laughs> there will be no any harm. So like, you know, let your children go and explore and, you know, be anywhere. There is no harm. And you think, how is that? Mm. And, you know, uh, definitely the description is just beautiful, beautiful. But what, do you, what do you make of the, the statement about the leaves of the tree of life being for the healing of the nations? Well, I guess we try to try to do our best guess, Peter. You go for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd rather I'd rather tackle the fruit. <laughs> well, you, you go with the fruit, but I, I do want to come back to the, the the leaves because I don't think it's just saying we're going to make good tea out of the, the, the leaves of the you know the tree of life. Mm. Well, there was to, on the tree of life. There were going to be a different a different fruit every month. Mm. Each month there would be a new fruit, and you ate of that tree of life, and eating that fruit meant your life would continue eternally. Mm. And that's so. It, it's an interesting concept. We we have an apricot tree in the backyard that was flattened when a tree next door dropped a branch on top of it, and that and we've only got one apricot on it this year. So we're going to wait the whole year to get one apricot, and there's. Three, three in my family at home, so it's going to be <laughs> <laughs> very but, precious. But this tree has a new fruit every month, mm. and it's it, it's a tree that is fed from the living water that flows from, from the, the throne, throne of God. God. Yeah. Yes. So, do I understand you well, Peter, that you're saying like this month we'll have bananas, next month we'll have a new <laughs> a new fruit. It will be like mangoes. And I'm just waiting until the durian will be there. Oh, look, who, who gets to choose? Anyway, Roman. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that as we are using the words new creation, so we are not talking only about the time in future. Mm. We are talking about now, our mm. days. Mm. And we are the new creations, but still physically the same. And I, I understand this revelation, you know, those leaves for healing. There is no sickness there. So what for the healing? So it means that it's rebuilding us to the to the first moment as man was created, mm. and that's how I understand it. That, that, uh, maybe well, maybe there is other mm. understanding. We we are just it's not, not written more, but but you know I understand that that you know as being new created now. Uh, I mean our belief in salvation in Jesus, following Him, uh, and and we notice that. It takes time also to to come back, even in our face, in our in our trust to Him. We are growing all the time, every day. So in the same way, we'll grow there, you know, to, to the new image. Yeah, and I guess that that's where I was going with the question, because you know, when when it talks about the leaves being for the healing of the nations, you think about what or who is going to be there. You know, we will have nations and peoples that have been at war with each other you know i i have no doubt in heaven there will be russians and ukrainians and yeah. poles there will be serbs and croats there will be you know africans of every tribe there will be you know asians from every part of asia um what happens when we all get there together and we we are there with christ now what christ has for us overcomes that but if we've got this thousand years where we get to review God's judgments, then maybe there's some healing that needs to go on in that time for us to be ready to live together for all eternity. Because yes. as, as we've noticed at the end there, there is no more sea, Peter, no more nations and languages. We are one in Christ yeah. together. 
you know, Christ yeah. just as he has his people now. Mm. Um, that'll be his people mm. for, forever. I wonder if there is a, a physical aspect as well. Mm -hmm. uh, because Adam and Eve, that when they first were created by God, they were like 20 times more, they had 20 times more vitality that we have today. Otherwise, the human being would have been destroyed. I mean... Look what uh, yeah, we, uh, coronavirus we, has done in the last two years to us. Yeah, we like were decimated. Out in 70 years. Yeah. We would have been killed, decimated long time ago by viruses. So uh, definitely the human being was much, much stronger. As the Bible says, people used to live hundreds of years, you know. So no doubt about that. That was exactly uh, what it is. Uh, and I wonder if... If, you know, I'll just uh, stand side by side to Adam and he'll be like, <laughs> wow. <laughs> and the, the, the healing of the nations would be maybe the physical aspect to see actually what cause has caused. And gradually we'll all be brought back to the same level of how God created So, so an extension us. of the reversal of sin, if you like, and its yeah, effects. Yeah, but a gradual, so we, we'll, we'll see that. We'll see, we'll have a new understanding how much we have lost, how destructive sin was in our lives, in biological life, mm. intellectual life. I mean, we are so limited in our intellectual capacities now uh, as if we compare ourselves with people that lived long time ago. Like, you know, Moses wrote... You know, the first few books of the Bible, but he wrote that from his memory. I don't know where he had that memory to write all those generations yeah, yeah. <laughs> or genealogies. You know, yeah. genealogy, definitely he had a good memory, all right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and I guess, you know, whether it happens that way or in some other, it's interesting to, to you know, to wonder how it's going to happen. And, yeah. and I guess what matters is that we get there. Now, I want to, we'll come back to the end of Revelation or some closing from Revelation 22, but I want to just step aside from looking into the text right now and just ask you to reflect back, you know, this is our final session, reflect back what for you ties Revelation off? What do you see as the message that we need to walk away with from Revelation? What, what gives it the perspective that we, we need to take away? Until Christ came as a man, God spoke to his people through prophets. Mm -hmm. And those prophets helped reveal more and more information about God. In the beginning, there was, when Adam and Eve had children, they lost that connection with God. They didn't see God. They didn't uh, physically understand who he was. They, they could do it spiritually, but not physically. After the cross, the prophets, John was the last of the prophets who, who had seen Christ. And he wrote a book that was going to cover the period from the cross until the second coming. So he was giving you the messages for 2,000 years, maybe a little longer. And that so... He, the book of Revelation spans that time mm. and it begins with the glory of the cross and the cruelty of the cross and then it goes through steps and stages that mankind is going to go through, the seven churches mm -hmm. and it identified Christ and it identified Christ as the one sitting on the throne. Then he, when, when we understand that the one on the throne was God, he took the scroll of the covenant and he began to break the seals on it. He took the scroll of the law to show that the law was important. And he began to break this, the seals. And four, the first four seals had colour. White was the first colour. And white is representative of God. So that if you come to Christ, if you have him as the first in your life, then the other colours become unimportant because you've got to the, to the highlight. The second colour was red, and it is God's warnings to people. Mm -hmm. The third colour was black, which is Satan, and chapter 12 of Revelation identifies Satan. So the 12th chap from the 12th chapter on, you understand the apostasy and the error of sin. And then the last colour was the colour of death, the everlasting death. 
So you've, you've got then those four colours and the book of Revelation highlights those sequences. The law is important, the purity of and the purity of the law of God and the love of God is what our aim is. If we get to that, we don't need the warnings. We have overcome the apostasy of Satan and you will not be judged with the eternal death. Mm. So look at, it, look at the book as messages to help you understand the steps that you need to take to come back to the truth of Christ. Yeah. And I think that's, that's one thing we've really enjoyed looking at is, is through the colours of Revelation, how it highlights that aspect. And, and I just want to clarify, because I know, I know what you're not saying. We're not saying that keeping the law is going to save us. Mm. The law is, you know, as, as James says, it's simply a mirror that we look into that we see where we've gone wrong mm. and it drives us to Christ. Got it. Well, I'm talking about the law not written on tablets of stone, it's written in your heart. Mm. On stone it says, thou shalt not. But in your heart, you don't live with a desire for revenge. You don't live with a, a desire to steal. If you consider the other person, the other people around you. You don't lie, you don't steal, you don't commit adultery. You don't do anything to hurt or harm yeah. other people. But, so, but the big message for you is grab hold of that white if you if you want to look yeah. at it in those terms. In, look in look to the white of Christ, yeah. the purity of Christ. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Peter. For me, this book, uh, we never, we cannot forget about it, is the book about Jesus. <laughs> That's what you said. That's from the first. Uh, verse of the book, you know, first sentence, you know, that's revelation of Jesus Christ. And uh, probably all we notice that there are some parts of the book that they are, uh, it's difficult to find Jesus in some scenes, but we can find him always. Mm -hmm. We can always find him, but we have to concentrate. I, I, I can tell it from my own personal experience that, you know, the book of Revelation for many years, when I preached from this book, mm -hmm. when, I, when I shared, studied this book with many people, uh, more concentration was on some events, some, on the old scenario for the future events, everything what is coming. Well, the only future event that, that the most important, and it repeats in Revelation, we, we used to say that four times, but how many times it repeats, you know, uh, even in the book, uh, last chapter, in the last chapter of the book, mm -hmm. you know, the second coming of the Lord. Yeah. That's, that's the desire. That's, that's something what we, what we want to have. So, so that's for me the most important. And if it is the most important, so I, I would dare to say that for our times that we are living in, that's the most important book of the Bible mm -hmm. now. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Because it, it, it just draws us back to him. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Roman. Mm. Michael? Yeah, I'm just looking at the last passage here, um, chapter 22, starting with verse 7 all the way to 21. Um, and it's is the final appeal mm. after after God has revealed to His people all the struggles, the battles, the difficulties that we are going to go through, and then the final reward, He puts forward the final appeal. After this beautiful scene, after, you know, suddenly we yes. are coming yeah. back to. And to uh, He tells us it's yeah. worth it's worth all the battle. It's worth to to be what you have to be morally. Be up. Uh, uh, you know, upright, um, um, be pure, be, be righteous. It's worth all the, the effort, you know. Um, <clears throat> there's this, there's this um, thing um, circulated on, on Facebook, you know, what is it hard? Is it like it's hard to be divorced and it's hard to be married? And then it says, choose, choose your, your hardest. Right? It's hard this, it's hard that, and there is a list of things, I can't remember all of them. There is a list of things, it's hard to do this, it's hard to do this, just choose, choose your heart. And that's true, it, it's hard to, to be purely, purely, morally pure in this world. It's hard, 
all right, when you see so many people cheating, you see dishonesty, you see you are attracted to, to go on that path. And it's hard to remain honest and correct and, you know, but then you have to choose your heart, which, because being dishonest is not that easy. Mm. You know, you come in conflict with the law and then you can end up in prison. So choose your heart. So we are here. I'm here because I have chosen my heart. Uh, uh, to, to, to press towards uh, a, a, a better life in, in, a, in a sense of uh, morality, in a sense of, you know, what, what I believe and what I want to achieve in life and to influence people around me. I have chosen my, my heart and we have all chosen that. But it's worth all the effort. And I just want to, this message... If you have not understand anything from the book of Revelation, anything from what we've been trying to explain, just read the, the final bit mm. and, and do according to what you understand in the final, final message, final appeal and call that God is putting forward. You know, I'm coming soon and I'll bring my reward with me. Come and be part of, of the victorious, you know, party, come and be part of my people. And it's just just beautiful the way it finishes. It brings back, you know, uh, Jesus' words, Jesus' teachings, uh, everything that that he he has taught us, it just here encapsulates here in his final message. Thanks, Michael. Roman? Yes, I, I would like to add that something interesting happens in this last chapter also. That, as in the first one, he introduced himself. And we know through the whole book who is he. In the last chapter, he's introducing once again, a little differently. Mm. Still, I am. But, you know, that, that's something beautiful. You know, I'm the roots and offspring of David, the bright and morning star. Mm. So, uh, what it tells us suddenly that, that you know, uh, for Jewish people, that will be very important, for sure. But, but you know, uh, he's... The, the result of it, of, of this introduction, is obvious, you know, the spirit and the bride say, come. And, and you know, it's, it's so, so that's, uh, that's the reason he's introducing himself again. Just remember, who am I? Yeah. Re- keep it in mind all the time. Just come to me. Uh, I'm coming for you, to take you. So, so just remember, who am I? You're saying he's going to be Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Yeah. That's 19th chapter, yeah. Darren, you've asked Roman, myself, and Michael. You haven't told us <laughs> your opinion. Look, for me, the book of Revelation pulls together all the loose threads from the Old and the New Testament and wraps it up in the most magnificent picture. Correct. It has dark and it has light, but the light overcomes the dark. Yeah. yeah, and and in Christ, you know, we can have that same experience now. Um, I think it, it, you know, just as with Daniel's prophecies, they keep culminating in the second coming. So this keeps drawing us back to the second coming of Jesus. It's an event that we can barely begin to imagine the reality of it, but it's been promised and it's going to happen. Um, you know, for me, I want to live my life now in anticipation of that day and to live my life now in anticipation, I need Christ now. Yeah. And I think the, you know, the, the message that it comes through with, there is this persistence, if you like, this insistence that you know, the second coming is not far away. Mm-hmm. Um, what does not far away mean? I don't know. God's timing is God's timing and I'm okay with that. Um, you know, when I was young, time seemed to stretch out forever. Now I'm a little further down the track. Man, time goes quick. And you realise that this life is, is short. And Revelation says, hey, take a step back. Look at a bigger picture. You know, don't get caught up in every day's headline. Look at the bigger picture of what's going on. There is a battle between Christ and Satan. Christ, we already know, is victorious. Christ is coming back. He's going to sort everything out. Yeah. And I can't wait. There's, there's three passages. Peter, you've, you've led to this very neatly. 
three passages that we, we do want to read. Revelation 22, verse 7. So these are all out of Revelation 22. In verse 7, it says, Look, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy written in this scroll. Then you go down to verse 12, and Jesus says, Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I'll give to each person according to what they have done. And then the second last verse. He who testifies to these things says, What? Yes, I am coming soon. And then it finishes off saying, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. We hope that you have really been blessed by this discussion and study of the book of Revelation. But the thing we want to finish with is simply saying, this is not the end of your journey of discovery. It's just the beginning. There's more to discover in Revelation. There's more to discover in Christ and We've made that decision to follow Christ. Mm. We hope you will too and that you will embark on an amazing journey of discovery that will go on not only in this life but in the life to come. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for giving us this book, for giving us the whole Bible but even more that Jesus came and walked this earth to show us the reality of God, that he was God with us. Jesus who was the light and the life, who was the one who brought comfort and security when in this life we had none. So Father we just thank you for guiding us and I pray that for everyone who is watching and studying on their own today that they will indeed continue the journey and continue to grow in their knowledge and their walk with Jesus. In this we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 If you would like to continue the journey and you have questions that you'd like to ask, there is a, an email address that you can email or contact the church through the website that you viewed this. The email address is revelationreimagined at gmail.com and we wish you all God's blessings as you go from here. Thank you.